so as the abstract says there, that I've just put up on the, the front, um, this is kind of a bit like other people said early on, like Kevin made a few points about Brexit, said we don't really have the answers. And I'm just kind of raising a few thoughts here, almost, um, I guess, as not quite the, the observations of an outsider, because I've been doing archaeology for the past five or six years, having come into things uh, later in life, shall we say, from, from other careers. Um, but I just want to kind of look at the way the whole um, talk about funding of the heritage sector generally and archaeology specifically um, is set against um, you know, Brexit, which has been mentioned a lot, and the, the cuts agenda. Um, and I actually make the point that in a lot of respects, I just don't agree with the whole premise of that. I mean, I accept a lot of the consequences and things that are happening that are, are really happening. Um, but I think we need to have a conversation about why and how that has come about and, and, and essentially, as I've put the bottom there, to make ourselves heard, perhaps um, for a bigger share of, the, of um, what the UK has to offer. Um, so uh, there's two things there. That, that's my project, um, Adopting Archaeology at York, which is a CDA with the CBA. Um, so my research kind of is broadly related to this to do with the sustainability of the heritage sector and archaeology within it and that's my other my own twitter feed there um and it's interesting hearing a lot of these other um points being raised like um one of the things kevin mentioned about brexit which isn't in here as a slide but um i was i think probably one of the world's oldest erasmus students in 2013 14 um when i went to sweden for six months um and apart from all the conversations you could have about how academia works in the two different countries and, and the, the archaeology there compared to here. Um, it's it really genuinely scary to think in, I don't know, five, ten years time, that option wouldn't be open to people in, in the same situation that I was in. It's just really weird. Um, but I'm not going to use the big word again, hopefully, because uh, we've heard a lot of that already and we'll hear more later on. Um, so, financial broad kind of brush talk about the economy. The UK is a really wealthy country um, and the cuts agenda, it, it isn't a case that we don't have a big debt problem because obviously we do, we have a massive deficit and, and it's a big issue, it's I think the biggest it's been since the Second World War. So you can't deny reality. But you know, there are lots of economic indicators, there's someone on your left there um, which you can go into in quite some detail and they're all broadly quite good, much as it pains me to say that, and no credit whatsoever to George Osborne, who was on one of Rob's slides early on. But the UK economy does okay. Uh, the FTSE, which again is a very broad brush indicator there, twice in the last 12 months has reached an all-time high. Just, it's kind of flourishing in that respect. So the notion that the UK doesn't have any money is, is just false. The question about how and where we spend that money, I think is under addressed, certainly from a heritage point of view, and within heritage from an archaeology point of view. Um, so these are some of the things that I will mention, but I've put references on there to some of the, the more in-depth figures that you can go to. But as I say, I am just fairly clearly saying, I just don't personally accept that we are as um, stuck for cash, if you want to call it that, in the public sector as, as people say we are. I mean, we obviously are because the purse holders and you know, the powers that be are um, making the cuts and they're controlling the budgets. But that doesn't mean it's the only option and I think we're being sold a lie to a large degree and of course everything that trickles down from that, um, that's the, about the only trickle down we have in our economy, um, is, is hitting the, the sector hard as people have said and I think we'll say later on. Um, so related to that, uh, there's also a growing um, agenda within financial and political commentators about the veracity of, of of the whole sort of neoliberal um, agenda, the cuts agenda. So, uh, a bit old now, I think six, seven years. Um, maybe you should play that at lunch. Well worth watching if you haven't seen it. David Harvey's kind of RSA overview on. Uh, I, I suppose that was a reaction to the first banking crisis, but a lot of the points it makes within there, I would both recommend. We haven't got time to play it, but I would recommend. Um, and also say that they absolutely apply to the structure of the UK's economy and why our sector and archaeology within our sector is in 
such kind of peril and cash starved um, situations. Um, that's this week. Paul Mason, fight, and I'm not saying archaeology should all go on strike. You know, we shouldn't stop HS2 or, or whichever developments by withdrawing our labour. However, um, we shouldn't also accept, <coughs> for all those reasons I've just said, the broad brush narrative um, that there's no money, so you just have to deal with it and accept the cuts. It's just, it's just not true. Um, and and uh, again, perhaps a bit dangerous to use Greece as an example of uh, how to model your finances. Um, <coughs> but I think the bottom point there, that quote, why is so little hope growing among so many riches, is a valid one. Um, you know, we, we are a resource rich and cash rich, albeit we all have money, uh, economy. So um, the amount of that that's dedicated to heritage, as I say, I'll come on to talk to you now. Um, but it, it, it's, a, it's a fairly simplistic overview and, and um, I mean, my previous roles, I, I was um, in the retail sector, that technical uh, thing before that, and then lastly a finance manager, a music charity. Um, so I'll come into archaeology fairly late in life. I do think I can bring a slightly different perspective than somebody who's been embedded in, in this sector for 30 years. Um, they've got far more, I guess, understanding of the sector, but uh, I do think when you've done other things and you look from the outside in, you see some of the glaring, uh, not inconsistencies, but just strange ways in which the sector handles itself, presents itself to the outside world, and is consequently dealt with by the powers that be. Um, I'll just put that on again, because it's, uh, just to reiterate, you know, that, that is a monumental increase um, in the last 12 months, and it's at an all time high. It's just scarily, um, so prolific in, in its in its results. Uh, some of that's to do with exchange rates, in fairness. But even so, you know, this kind of argument that oh we, we've got to make all these cuts is just um, false. I think is the the best way of saying it. So, moving on from there, um, if we accept austerity as a choice, then um, are we essentially, as a broad society, choosing to allow our heritage to pay the price to suffer, as somebody said earlier, on death by a thousand cuts? Um, and I, I think we are, and, uh, and it's, it's puzzling to see why, because as others have said, you know, um, archaeology is very popular. If you speak to people and they say, oh, I'm an archaeologist, they say, oh, that's really interesting. And they, they, everyone's got a little story and everyone has a, the recollection of a site they like to visit. But it often just stops there. Um, that kind of engagement with it, um, it's not that people don't value it, and it's just that they kind of assume it sits almost outside of the mainstream. And I don't know if they think it doesn't need the resources or it doesn't warrant them but you know at the same time as you get this excited um, happy familiarity with, with the discipline uh, there's a little example I'll give in a second of um, a Tory MP that came to a meeting that Rob and I were at in Altrincham um, it's just empty words in, in some respects the chap came along he was the head of the 1922 committee and I'm not saying any anything about him or his policies but his kind of little opening homily was how valuable archaeology was to him as a, as a memory and he, and he had these deep, um, meaningful love of, of the local area brought around by somebody explaining, I think it was a local barrow, um, was what he said. But of course, he's not in the All Party Archaeology Committee. He was kind of very late to the meeting, paid lip service to it and off he went. So this deep abiding love of the subject <coughs> that he professes when I, I would say there are votes to be had, just means nothing. It doesn't mean anything in his, his sort of actions that the support he gives meaningful support locally or that's what it seems to me anyway. Perhaps I'm being, doing him a slight disservice there. Um, but he'll have to cope. Um, so as I said there's this thing about choice. Um, you then look at a lot of what's going on. There are, are real trickle down um, consequences of the financial constraints um, it, it just has inevitable consequences because people are short of cash so whether it's the academic sector whether it's the commercial sector all that kind of hybrid of commer commercial <laughs> units that used to be uh, regional units and then the profit motive that other people have referred to <coughs> takes a dominance and all of a sudden there are cuts looming left right and centre yeah you know, drop dropping of the a level um, which is just Apparently only 10% of archaeologists um, currently in graduate things did A-level. I think it might even be less than that, so across um, undergrads, postgrads, it's about 10%. So you could say, well, it's not that important, but of course it, it's, it's one of those awareness things that as a youngster, 
it gets archaeology on your radar, even if you don't do it. At my local sixth form college, you know, none of my kids did um, A-level archaeology, but it, it was taught at, at Oldham sixth form, and it's it's on the radar. Well, if it's if it goes, it isn't, and I'll come back to the, that kind of awareness at a young age um, on another example. The garden bridge. <laughs> it's a very simplistic thing to say, you know, if, if we didn't do that, we wouldn't have to do that. Um, and, and I'm not saying that. It's, it's not a binary choice between, you know, if, that, if somebody hadn't committed £50 million to that oddity, that that £50 million could be bundled up, got to Lancashire, and we would save five regional museums. But the reality is that money would keep those museums open for, if you take the budgets that Lancashire Council used to justify those cuts, that's 15 years of operation for those museums. So because of hypothecated budgets and all the rest of it, yes, that £50 million pounds there isn't the same £50 million that you could keep those open for for 15 years. I understand that. That's not how the economy works. But broadly, those are the choices that we are allowing our leaders and society to make. So it is a binary choice in, in that respect because those museums will close we might not even build that bridge and it's still going to cost 30 million you know it's just it's just weird you know why why would you do it? if we're skint if we've no money why would we do that well we do that because we're not skint and there's lots of money it's just the way we choose to spend it and then you've got the whole london centric argument as well but i'm not talking about that this applies nationally um at, at all levels really um so as i say it's not a binary choice um and that, here's another one that isn't a binary choice. And you could say, oh, you're just not in favour of defending the country and that's not fair. And all the Brexit conversations can come into, into play. Um, but you've got to reach the point where you ask yourself, what are we protecting? I mean, who from is a completely separate conversation that we can have over a pint. But why? If, if we are poor and we've got to close, the, the, the map on, on your right there is from the Museum Association's uh, report into closure since 2005. And depending on the parameters that you set, you can obliterate the country with, with exclamation marks um, rather than a Chinese nuclear bomb. Um, but, you know, I'm not suggesting we live in a, a blasted wasteland of, of nothing, but guarded by tridents. But you, you have to wonder do we need to spend that money? It's like. It's like I'm sure we all know people who earn perfectly decent salaries, who maybe as a couple or as an individual, but they all, they've no money. They, they skin every month because they're overcommitted. They spend too much, they move too often, they've got their cars too new, whatever. They just live slightly beyond their means. And kind of as a country, you know, are we not suggesting to spend 200 billion pounds on a defence system is beyond our means when we're closing museums, when we can't fund an A-level that is culturally important, when education is, is stuck with all the problems that other people discuss. I'm just saying it's a strange, <coughs> excuse me, sort of contradiction it, to my mind. It, you know, it doesn't carry through. And then onto the sector. Um, this isn't a criticism of the Louisville Museum in any way, or the Merseyside Archaeological Society, which. Um, just had its 40th anniversary and, it, and is strongly embedded within and um, related to the activities of the museum. Both really good organisations. Um, however, given how key the MAS has been, if you walk around the museum, you, you could leave, even as a fairly engaged, not, not just <coughs> scooting through as quickly as you can, as a fairly engaged person who reads all, there's a really good timeline at, at the Museum of Liverpool. Um, <coughs> Excuse me, but it barely mentions the MAS. You, you have to seek it out, and even if you're looking for it, quite hard to find. And I think that's that's kind of it's symptomatic of, of the sector generally. We don't co-promote each other. I think for political reasons and neutrality, and not seen to be partisan. I understand why museums do that to a degree and other cultural institutions. But I think the time is is coming where, as a broad sector, we need to to co-promote each other uh, and, and make the point more forcefully that without this we wouldn't have you know the museum that you're in now and it, it just, it's just hard to say I'm not picking on them I think it's, it's fairly typical um, of the sector and I just don't think it's, it's appropriate anymore for us to have these diverse bits of everyone bumping along 
doing their own thing, but not presenting these united fronts to the wider society and therefore to the budget holders and the people who are um, kind of raining down this horror of cuts on us. Um, so just to recap, because uh, the time is up, you know, we are not skint, it's just a complete myth. So we should take a bigger slice of the pie. Uh, we just absolutely should. Uh, I've run out of time a little bit, but I was just going to point out that um, that's kind of a, a I'll, I'll come back to that maybe another time, but you compare archaeology to accounting, for example, both graduate professions, look at the CFA minimums, and then look at these uh, along the bottom, that's the four big financial bodies. It's horrendous. You know, why do we accept things that are not just a little bit, 10, 15 percent, like 50 percent less than equivalent um, professions? It, it just shouldn't be the case. It, it's de decades old issue, but the point is it, it needs, needs addressing. Um, so can't really go through those, <coughs> dwell too much on the other bits. Um, so there we go. I think that I've put it at the end again. It, it sums things up. It's fairly scary the, the way the, the purse strings have been kind of tightened, I guess. And um, nobody wants that. So there we go.